If you have an interest in Japanese culture, you inevitably learn about Japanese cuisine. Conversely, Juzo Itami's 1985 film Tampopo focuses on food, but its perspectives go far beyond what we eat. Today's frame is culinary nationalism, how certain dishes are linked to various nationalities, which will lead to explorations of other aspects of life. If you haven't seen Tom Popo, I would recommend watching it first. Like in Omakase, part of the film's delight is in not knowing what comes next, moving from one dish to another in perfect transition. Please form your own independent conclusions. There are four often overlapping nationalities presented in the film. For each, I propose a theme that ties it to society. The first category is Japanese food. The main representative of this is a meal at a soba restaurant. There's also a traditional breakfast, a brief scene at a yakiniku restaurant, and a preparation of omu rice, which overlaps with the second category, Western food. This includes the French ordering scene, the pasta, the scene with the homeless gourmets, and the grocery store. The third category, Chinese food, is quite expansive. China is represented by the dim sum girl, the Peking duck, and the fried rice. This is also where I will address ramen, the essential food of the movie. Quite a few famous scenes have been left out. I will come back to them since they fall outside the above categorization, but there is still plenty to say. Japanese food is presented alongside messages of domesticity and nationality. Probably the most Japanese scene in the whole film is the meal at the soba restaurant. Soba noodles have been popular in Japan since the Edo period, and noodles in general are sometimes called soba in Japanese. Katharina Hoff illuminates details that complete the setting. In this scene, the roped focus character is accompanied by women in kimonos and is brought to a sitting table on a tatami mat. Hoff points out a twist. The man's order contains foreign elements. It includes kamo nanban soba and tempura soba. Kamo nanban soba is made with ducks and leeks or onions. Nanban means barbarian and was used historically to refer to things that are foreign, in this case the onions. Tempura, meanwhile, is a cooking method introduced to Japan by Portuguese traders in the 1500s. However these influences have snuck in, the overall effect for Japanese audiences is familiarity. Soba is included under the category of washoku, a term referring to Japanese cuisine. Why is a character indicating affiliation with Japan, and shoku means food stuff? Japan has a long culinary history, but washoku as a concept was only invented after 1868 with the dawn of the Meiji era. It was a response to the influence of new cuisine from overseas and the desire to establish a modernized nation with a cohesive identity like Western countries and competitors. The conception of domestic Japanese cuisine exists in opposition to the foreign. The other example of washoku in the film is a Japanese breakfast, complete with rice and miso soup, served in a domestic setting. I am intentionally blurring the definitions of domestic as relating to the household and domestic as relating to the inside of one's country here. In these scenes, both of these are woven into one. A very typical Japanese meal contrasts with a non-traditional family structure, a single mother, her son, and an unrelated father figure and a male companion. Still, that they all enjoy a Japanese breakfast completes the illusion of domesticity. Other foods are associated with Japan, falling outside of washoku but with their own familial implications. Our protagonists dine at a yakiniku restaurant in a courtship scene. This style of grilling meat was a Korean import in the post-war era. At another point, a young boy requests omu rice, a common comfort dish of fried rice wrapped in a French omelet. It is prepared by another non-traditional father figure, a competent caretaker, who detects that he hasn't eaten and guides him through cooking a portion. Omu rice is so permeated with Western influence that it is thought of in the next category, Yoshoku. The character Yo, literally meaning sea, refers to that which is foreign in opposition to Wa. If the unifying theme of Japanese food examples is domesticity and nationality, for Yoshoku I think it is class and nationality. An early vignette involves ordering at an upscale French restaurant. On the foreign domestic axis, this is the opposite of the soba restaurant. The restaurant is in a fancy western hotel. The waiter appears in a dinner jacket. The menu is written in French and English only. Yet, in both scenes, an expectation for Japanese behavior in etiquette is expected. Expected, but disestablished. Avoiding embarrassment for your superiors and the implicit promises of career advancement for doing so is supplanted by reverence for a perfectly and skillfully assembled meal. Notice how the cinematography reinforces the play of contrasts. The rigid song and dance of proper seating is shot with a comically shaky handheld camera. An orderly exterior is betrayed by stuffiness and discomfort. Then, when the man in the lowest seat starts his order, rock solid. And so it continues until he completes defying the expectations of his position and we pan to the other diners, literally red in the face. We are then visually transported to the spaghetti slurping scene. An older woman is teaching young women the proper way to eat spaghetti. 
she mentions that noisily eating noodles is forbidden in foreign countries. We infer that girls belong to affluent households, or at least households with ambitions towards high society, which implicitly involves learning the ways of the West. Subtly, class intersects with ethnicity. Just like painting faces red in the previous scene, the instructor is painted white. Her facial makeup is clearly lightning. The instructor chooses this application perhaps in part to enhance her credibility in teaching about Western ways. The content of her lesson parallels this. Making no sound while eating noodles unlearns a Japanese tendency where slurping is acceptable, even desirous. This is then parodied by an actual white person who, like the man with the specialized order, breaks a silly convention through the simple enjoyment of his meal. Later, homeless gourmets satiricize fixation on the West not just through parody, but with irony. This peculiar group, a proxy for consumer culture as a whole, is so fixated on the perfect meal that they ignore the absence of another necessity, shelter. One man in particular monologues about a French wine he had, even expounding on the weather conditions five years ago in the faraway winemaking region of Bordeaux. This is despite his having minimal protection from the weather that falls on his own head. The camera on these men is patient, giving us plenty of time to perceive their faces and them plenty of time to share their wisdom and their talent. It seems in Atami's view, it's better to be a wise vagabond than a rich fool. Finally, the fetishization of Western food is taken literally in the grocery store sequence. A woman suggestively fondles Western fruits, cheeses, and pastries, affixed by an obsession with the West that has risen to sexuality. Even the man trying to stop her is introduced inhaling expensive Western liquor with a mechanism that is itself quite suggestive and phallic. So far, food has been romanticized as representing a household or nation, and fetishized as an object of allure and desire. With Chinese cuisine called chukagyori in Japanese, I believe the theme is modernization and transition. A dim sum girl is dressed in traditional Chinese clothing and carries her offerings on a shoulder-mounted pole, not a cart. Her appearance is flanked spatially and temporally by wonderful views of urbanized cityscapes flying by, sometimes in accelerated motion. Japan's sophisticated train system is the symbol of the country's post-war revitalization, moving ever forward and leaving China behind. However, not everything must be discarded. The owner of the high-end western grocery store closes up and immediately heads for a Peking duck restaurant. Peking duck is a rarefied preparation, seen in Japan as following a long static history. In this portrayal, the traditional ways of China is something to respectfully reproduce, and advancement into the future is not the ultimate virtue. Immediately following, another domestic scene involves fried rice. Although fried rice is universal anywhere rice is eaten, it's coded as Chinese here and in Japan generally. The Japanese name derives directly from the Chinese chao fan and is written in katakana. Also, the mother cooks and serves the meal in a walk. This scene is interrupted with a single shot of a moving train, this time a sleeper car, perhaps linking it to the dim sum girl. The transition here is different but clear, the transition between life and death. Finally, the movie's central dish. Ramen has become tremendously popular in recent years, with its rich flavors spreading all over the world and converting international fans. Tampopo exists in a crossroads between the dish's Chinese origins and its modern conception which is Japanese or even supranational. Ramen became established in Japan during the late 1800s following Japanese imperial expansions into China. One popular story is that it gained further popularity after World War II when migrants and returning settlers arrived with new recipes and tastes, setting up Chinese restaurants. The name itself is derived from the Chinese for pulled noodles and shares its pronunciation, la mian. In Tompopo, ramen is still unabashedly a Chinese dish. Our first image of ramen has it served in bowls with a Chinese dragon design and a Chinese calligraphic design called shuang shi, indicating joy. These details are everywhere. The first ramen shop visited advertises itself as selling chu ka soba, or Chinese noodles, an earlier name for ramen. Another features a chef wearing a Chinese shirt, and a customer wearing a Chinese skullcap. In yet another scene, we see a waitress in a Chinese top, and a chef who even speaks Chinese, responding to arigato with arigato. <laughs> The progression of the titular shop is a metaphor for the journey of its signature dish. It begins in a dilapidated state as Raireikin. Later, as Tompopo the woman starts to blossom as a chef, she lends her native Japanese name to the restaurant, which is given a new sign written in messy katakana, reflecting the redefinition of ramen in the Japanese tradition. The ultimate form of the restaurant shows internationalization of ramen in a way precocious to the film's 1985 release. The Japanese signage has been replaced with Roman lettering. The inside has been similarly remodeled, maintaining the layout of a traditional ramen restaurant but dressed like a modern western kitchen. Tompopo is clothed like a French chef, and the hanging boards with menu items have been replaced with framed pictures. 
Even the bowls have been wiped of their traditional decorations. Chinese influences are left in the past, with Western ones the destination of progress. One more group of famous scenes belong to a category that supersedes nationality. They revolve around the man in the white suit. Despite his dapper dress, I would label this last category the primal. Sometimes the best bite comes from nature itself. This man upholds that through an obsession with raw foods. He embodies the primal state of nature, not just in his diet, but in his behavior. He is a gangster, and shows his willingness to use intimidation and violence from the opening scene. He is also fascinated in sex, with his intimate engagements with his partner. His food is rife with sexual imagery. The egg is literally the female zygo, and still doesn't compete with another scene. A fresh oyster, long compared to the human vulva, is marked with blood and then eaten out of the hand of a young girl. Blood, unexpectedly drawn from the lip of the man, ties the scene both to his violent tendencies and associates the girl with virginity and purity. Violence is eventually turned against him. Humans eat, fornicate, bleed, and die, and he shows no sadness in having gone through all of this. As he hemorrhages from his own innards, he states his one regret, that he could not have eaten the grilled intestines of boars that have gorged themselves on yams. Tom Popo is incredible. So much goes into what we eat that in just telling stories of food or in setting out to define national associations for them, wide aspects of society are addressed. Examining Japanese cuisine and its self-conception relates to how the Japanese nation conceives of itself, and how this serves as a macrocosm for the household. The place of Western influence food as an indicator of status can be similarly interpreted through considering broader Japanese views towards the West. An eye towards the future, a hope for prosperity, with more than a hint of opulence. Conversely, Chinese food and ramen itself is filtered by a transition from past to present, of Japan's historical influences, and how much should be persisted or surrendered. This relationship has evolved greatly in the decades since Tom Popo's release, with the future yet undefined. Finally, we were reminded that before society, we were just human animals, only sometimes dressed up in fancy suits. It is therefore incredibly apt that the movie closes with the most essential human meal of them all, 